Gord, you've produced a report on uh, deep geothermal and its potential in Canada. And when you say deep, I, I have to tell you, I was a little bit surprised because five to 20 kilometers beneath the surface of the earth is very, very deep. How do you manage to, uh, you know, uh, how does the technology work at that depth? Yeah, great question. So, so for our report, we modeled uh, a number of scenarios one at a three kilometer depth, one at four kilometer depth, one at five kilometer depth, and one in a future innovation scenario where we target a reservoir six kilometers deep. So we're not going quite down to, to 20 kilometers depth, but we're we're going deeper than is typical in the oil and gas industry, but not crazy uh, to, to a great extent, much deeper. There's wells that are being drilled in Northeastern BC that go down five kilometers. So like that, that's something that we do know how to do. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. That's just how geothermal works in the earth. So if we can target these, these deeper plays, you get a pickup in the efficiency of converting that hot water into electrons. So what our modeling showed is that the additional cost associated with targeting deeper plays that are hotter, although each individual well is more expensive because it's deeper, it's more expensive to drill deeper. Um, you pick up more energy than it costs you to get there. And it ultimately results in a lower levelized cost of energy. So the report that, that we put out shows that it's worth it to target these deeper reservoirs because there's a, a better prize associated with the uh, overall cost of, of developing a project if you can get to those hotter temperatures, engineer those reservoirs, and maintain those flow rates. Now, in the interviews I've done about other geothermal tech uh, approaches, um, the the water temperature seemed to be, if I remember correctly, around 120 C to 200 C. But you're say, suggesting that uh, the deep geothermal can get up to 400 C. Uh, uh, tell us about um, what advantages there are of having that super hot water. Yeah, it is something that's really, really exciting. And a lot of people are really looking at it. So as I just explained how when you're producing hotter water, it's converting into electrons more efficiently. So if you want to target uh, reservoirs that are able to generate hot water in excess of 375 degrees Celsius, which is, to be clear, not what we modeled in this report. This is sort of a, a, a newer emerging thing. Uh, under those temperature and pressure conditions, water is, goes to supercritical state. So you get about a 5x efficiency uplift in converting that, that hot water in supercritical form into electrons. So that is an absolute game changer for the amount of energy that you can generate out of this. And that's where we're talking about drilling those, those really deep tens of kilometers wells. Um, right now, the report that we, that we put out is focused on what do we have the current capability to do and what could we build the capacity to do in the very near future. This is something the technology might be a little bit further out. It might be more than five years ahead because we need to engineer high temperature tools that can withstand these types of deep, hot pressure conditions where, you know, the electronics don't melt and, and, and that uh, it's able to, to maintain that. Uh, but again, the size of the prize is worth uh, research and development. So um, that's sort of the, the, the landscape. And, and there's a lot of really exciting things happening in the super hot rock space. And um, yeah, it's something to definitely stay tuned for because worldwide, there's a lot of folks looking at it. Yeah, uh, maybe you could explain what supercritical steam is. I, I, I run across that all the time and I, I confess I, I don't understand it. Maybe you could explain it for us. Yeah, absolutely. So we're familiar with the three kind of standard states of matter. They're solid, liquid, and gas. Um, in super hot temperatures under uh, high pressure conditions, uh, and super water will take on a supercritical state, which means that it basically has fluid properties of both a liquid and a gas. So it's a lot more mobile. It 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 uh, will be produced more easily out of out of a out of a well because it will come to the surface more like a gas will. So you don't have to pump as hard to get there. And is the efficiency when it comes to spinning a turbine? There's just a lot more energy in it that you can then take into. Uh, generating electrons. When you've got that supercritical steam up to surface, how then, what technology do you use, use to convert it into electricity? 
Yeah, that's a, a great question. So there's a number of different ways that you can do it, but they all kind of fundamentally work in the same way. So generally you run it through a heat exchanger, which then heats a fluid that vaporizes and goes into uh, a vapor that can then spin a turbine. So you wouldn't necessarily have the fluid uh, flashing into steam directly in, at the surface uh, on its own. It'd probably be heating a secondary fluid to do it. So when you're at temperatures that are that high, what you're able to do is you're able to heat a fluid like water uh, for your first generation cycle, and then that'll cool your, your fluid temperature. And then you can have a second turbine that heats a secondary fluid like uh, propane or butane with a lower flash point that can then generate electrons at a slightly lower temperature. So you kind of get a double bump in what you're able to do. And this is all technology that uh, is well known, right? I mean, this has been around for decades. We understand how to do this and we can do it economically. Yeah, that's right. It's fundamentally not much different than the, the, the boiler type turbines that would run on a natural gas or coal-fired power plant. Um, there's a lot of folks using that organic Rankine cycle technology, what I just described, where you're heating a, a fluid like propane or butane or some other proprietary fluid. Um, that's also being deployed at waste heat to power projects and uh, at lower temperature resources as well. So this is commercial tech. There's a lot of folks that are doing it. It's, it's available off the shelf. Now, one of the issues that's come up, uh, you know, around the climate debate is how do you uh, decarbonize heavy industry that uses high heat, high industrial heat? And it would seem like this would be the perfect solution. Yeah, that's right. Like our report focused on generating electricity just because we wanted to generate, provide, right, right now a lot of geothermal isn't in the electricity models. It's often overlooked because it's literally underground and we haven't been doing much of it in Canada yet. So we were focused on, on electricity for this specific report, but there's a huge, huge, huge application for industrial heat. Uh, there's a little bit like, like I'm not a process engineer. There's a little bit of, um, nuance to matching your inlet temperature of what your boilers need uh, with the geothermal resource that you're trying to develop, making sure that you're you're sitting in a spot where your geothermal can be co-located with your plant. That really helps because, you know, hot fluids don't transport great distances super efficiently. So there's there's a few details to, to, to get across, uh, which is why we didn't model it in, in this scenario, but it's definitely something that industry should be looking at because this is a really great option to decarbonize. Yeah. One of the things about Alberta that maybe a lot of our viewers don't know is that Alberta has more engineers per capita than any place else in Canada. Uh, I mean, there's a tremendous engineering industry there, an engineering culture, and uh, much of it uh, is involved in drilling in one way or another. I mean, they, they, there are, and not only that, there's also uh, an oil field manufacturing se sector that builds rigs and builds all sorts of sensors and what have you that go into this. So it would seem like uh, that Alberta, particularly Calgary and Edmonton, are just really ideally suited to the development and scaling up of, of this technology? 100%. We have all the skills and capabilities here in this province to really start to bring this to the commercial forefront. It's just a matter of putting the pieces together. And in fact, a lot of Albertans, a lot of Canadians are working on international geothermal projects right now. We have folks that are doing insulated drill pipe in deep volcanoes in Oregon. Uh, we have ever that are deploying their, their drilling expertise in Germany. Canadians are all over the world doing this kind of work. It would be amazing if we can bring them back home to start building this industry locally. Right. And that also uh, begs the question of if they're already working internationally, uh, look at the, the economic opportunity, because whatever you develop in Canada can then be exported uh, overseas if necessary. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, as as we talked about a little bit earlier, most of the geothermal that's been deployed worldwide is in specialized hotspots, these sort of geologic uh, unicorn spaces like Iceland, where you have that heat, it's really close to the surface, you have that naturally occurring water. But most of the world doesn't look like that. If we can learn how to do geothermal 
maybe not everywhere, but in far more places than we're currently doing it. Uh, there's a lot more places around the globe that look geologically like Canada than there are geologic places that look like Iceland. That's sort of a unique case. So if we can build this capacity, it does become sort of a turnkey capability that we can start deploying elsewhere and exporting worldwide. Uh, Gord, thank you very much for this. Uh, this is episode two of a multi-part series, viewers, so we encourage you to come back. This is a fascinating topic um, uh, and a place where uh, Canada can have a first mover advantage and we could take a tremendous, uh, we could use this to, as part of our energy transition strategy and you've seen the stuff that we've been doing on the federal budget and how this uh, geothermal plays into that. So we're look, looking forward to many more conversations with you, Gord. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it.